guidance or to give us some practical guidance on representing uncertainty in hydrological predictions. Thanks, Dave. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. That's a pointer. Great. Yeah, Great. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around for the last talk of the day. Um, I'm going to be talking about some recent work that I've been doing with uh, Mark Thayer and Dimitri, Dimitri Kavetsky here at Adelaide Uni and George Kazira at University of Newcastle. And <coughs> what we've been doing is uh, evaluating a wide range of approaches for representing uncertainty in hydrological model predictions. And we've done this so we can actually provide some guidance about which sort of approach to use when representing uncertainty in these predictions. So hydrological predictions are relied upon by a wide range of users. So this includes water supply authorities, uh, irrigators, environmental managers. Um, so understanding the uncertainty in these, in these predictions is really important when you want to make decisions regarding these operations. So the overall aim of my research and that of our group is to improve probabilistic predictions. And when I talk about improving predictions, I'll um, explain a little bit about what we mean by this later. Uh, representing uncertainty in hydrological model predictions is, is quite challenging. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges associated with um, representing these errors. Um, and there are some approaches that exist for doing this. Uh, there's quite a few. Um, what we've done in this recent study is perform a comprehensive comparison between different approaches. Uh, for, rep for representing uncertainty. And I'm going to explain uh, some of these results today and from this we can provide recommendations about what sort of approach we should use under certain conditions. So an example of a service that relies on probabilistic hydrological model predictions is the Bureau of Meteorology Seasonal Streamflow Forecasts. Uh, this system provides forecasts uh, at about 200 locations around Australia you can go to their website and you can click on, you can see this map, and you can click on any of those dots and from that you will be provided with forecasts for streamflow over the coming season. Now these forecasts are relied upon by a large range of water managers around Australia, uh, but hydrological forecasts have a wide range of uncertainty. So what we've been doing with the Bureau of Meteorology over the last few years um, and currently in an IRC linkage project is to use our techniques to help characterise the uncertainty in these predictions and the aim is to ultimately improve these probabilistic predictions. So before I get onto the hydrological model predictions, I'd like to give a bit of an example about why considering uncertainty is important for decision making. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider the option of choosing action A or action B. And what we're looking at here is on the x-axis a measure of increasing system performance. And on this dashed line here we have what might be performance failure. Now if we have no uncertainty or we don't <coughs> consider any uncertainty in our system, we will choose the action which has the highest uh, performance here. Um, now, for a, if we consider a hypothetical uncertainty distribution about these predictions, we can see that if we do consider uncertainty and if we're risk averse, we might choose uh, the, the option or the action with the, with the lowest probability of failure, which is, which is action, action A. So what we're looking at here in these curves are probability density functions. Uh, the area to the left of this line corresponds to the probability of failure. And in this particular case, you would choose option A if you wanted to reduce the probability of risk. Now, in hydrological models, there's a range of sources of errors. In reality, we have true inputs to our system, which in include rainfall. We have true processes, such as groundwater and surface water flow. And we end up with true responses, such as stream flow. However, in our model, we require observed inputs. We feed this through a model which is based on conceptualised processes. And we compare our 
true responses with observed responses. So we have different sources of error. We have input errors. These are associated, uh, for example, with rainfall sampling errors. We have structural errors, um, which can be associated with lumping of physical processes to a catchment scale. Uh, we have output errors. An example of an output error might be due to rating curve errors, where you try and approximate the stream flow from the, from the water levels. So we have a range of sources of our errors in our hydrological models. So how do we model the uncertainty? What we can do is we can model the individual sources of uncertainty. So this would be modelling the input errors, the structural errors, and we could also model the output errors separately. So the advantage of using this particular approach is it allows you to diagnose the dominant sources of errors. If we find that the input errors are large, we might increase the density of our rain gauges. Now there's tools to be able to do this, to actually um, diagnose the different sources of errors. One of them is the Bayesian Total Error Analysis, or BADIA <laughs> framework, which was um, developed by Dmitry Kovetsky, George Kazira, Mark Th uh, Thayer and others in our group. But these are what we'd call research tools at this stage. Uh, you need significant expertise to be able to implement them, and they're not yet uh, easy to use for, for practitioners. Another approach is to just model the total uncertainty in predictions. So this involves lumping all errors together, and what we're going to try and model is the total errors, which is the observations minus the predictions. Okay? This is a lot simpler to implement than Batia. And there are practical approaches available which can produce reliable probabilistic predictions of total uncertainty, which I'll talk about a bit about later. Uh, the drawback of this approach is that you're unable to determine dominant sources of errors, but for many applications this isn't really that important. So modelling total uncertainty in predictions <coughs> is often the, um, the best option. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges in modelling errors. So modelling the um, uncertainty here. And I'm going to start by showing some, an example of some observed stream flow in red and predicted stream flow in black. And at the, the panel down the bottom here, we see the errors between these time series. And some of the things that we can notice from this are that the errors actually scale with flow. So that we have larger errors associated with larger flows. This is what we refer to as heteroscedasticity. Uh, we also have persistence in errors. So that when we have uh, large errors at one time step, we're likely to have large errors at the next time step as well. So the errors are not independent between time steps. So these are some of the features that we need to appropriately represent in our, error, in our uncertainty approaches if we're going to be able to come up with reliable probabilistic predictions. So there is a number of approaches out there that have been used in the literature for, um, for treating uncertainty in hydrological model predictions. Uh, in, but there's never really been a comparison between the different approaches for doing this. So what we have done is done an a, a empirical and theoretical comparison between a wide range of approaches for treating uncertainty. We looked at eight different approaches for modelling uncertainty. We considered 23 catchments around Australia and the USA. We looked at two hydrological models, GO4J and HBV. We performed cross-validation on our data. So we looked at leave one out validation on 10 years of data. And we ended up with about 3,500 model calibrations, which required about 4,000 CPU hours for about 150 days computation. Fortunately we had access to the Tarzard cluster which sped this up considerably and we evaluated our probabilistic predictions using multiple performance metrics which I'll get to in a second. Um, we found some surprising results with this analysis um, so that some commonly used approaches for modelling uncertainty produced um, quite poor predictions. And this research will be submitted shortly to Water Resources Research. So keep an eye out for that. Hopefully. 
Um, before I go on to, uh, to get to the results of uh, case studies, I'd like to talk a bit about what we look for in probabilistic predictions. So, when we assess the performance of our predictions, we want predictions that are reliable, so that the uh, predictions are statistically consistent with our observed data. We want predictions that are precise, so that we have small uncertainty in predictions as possible. And we also want low volumetric bias. So ideally, the total volume from our predicted flow will be the same as the observations. And an example of reliable, precise predictions is shown up here in the top right. Uh, the white dots show a hypothetical time series of streamflow observations. The red, uh, the orange and yellow bands <coughs> correspond to our 50 and 90th percentiles of our predictions. And we see that we have 90% of our observations lie within our 90% predictive limits. This is an indication that we have reliable predictions. We can also get reliable predictions with, but that are imprecise. So this particular example down the bottom shows a case where we have 90% of our predictions, 90% uh, of our observations in our 90% predictive, predictive limits, uh, but we have extremely wide uncertainty limits. Uh, this could be a case of the hydrological model failing and not providing much skill at all. And we can also have cases where we have precise but unreliable predictions so that we have a number of, well, most of our observations lie outside of our 90% confidence limits, which can be problems when you're trying to assess risk. And we can also have biased predictions. So, to get to the results, we found that uh, the choice of error model had a large influence on predictive performance. <coughs> so, firstly, I'm going to show some results from a perennial catchment in the USA. Uh, we're going to look at some predictive limits for high flows and low flows here. And firstly, we use the standard least squares approach to representing errors. Uh, if we choose a different approach, we can see that um, we end up with very different predictions. Uh, whereas SLS underestimates uncertainty for low flows and overestimates uncertainty for high flows, we find that log, log transformation pr performs much better. And this is highlighted by these metrics here. Lower, lower values correspond to better performance, and we see that for, both for all reliability, precision, and bias, we end up with better performance uh, for the log transformation. However, if we go to an ephemeral catchment where we have a higher proportion of zero flows, if we apply the log transformation here, we end up with much uh, worse predictions. We have really large predictive limits. A different error approach, such as the Box-Cox transformation, with a lambda of 0.2 can produce estimates which are much more precise and have less bias. So we've also used some theory to explain this in our manuscript. Um, so we've managed to tie some theory in with our empirical results. Uh, finally, I'll talk about um, the importance of including persistence in our, in our um, predictions. Uh, often we like to, we often need to aggregate our predictions from a daily time scale to a monthly time scale, since that often might be more relevant to the problem that we're looking at. Uh, if we neglect persistence in our error models and then we aggregate our predictions to monthly levels, we can end up with unreliable predictions with limits that are far too precise, uh, including persistence can overcome this problem. So in summary, uh, we have performed a comprehensive evaluation of a range of approaches for modelling total predictive uncertainty. These eight approaches range from simple to complex. Uh, we've looked at empirical results from 23 catchments and two hydrological models, and we've used mathematical theory to understand when and why approaches provide good or bad predictive performance. Now, practical impacts of this is that the simplest approach is often the best. So if you use prudent selection, um, of your error models, you can often come up with the best predictive performance. Now the good thing is this is simple to implement for practitioners and our study provides practical recommendations to obtain reliable and precise probabilistic predictions for whatsoever scenario you're looking at. And finally in the future, or currently, we're looking into developing some easy to use software um, for providing these predictions. So. If there are any interested partners, uh, come and have a chat to me afterwards and I can talk a little bit about, a bit about that.
Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. We've Thanks. probably got time for one quick question, if there's one in the audience. We have. Sorry, Dave. How long do you think it's going to be before practitioners routinely, routinely look at their errors at all? They should. I mean... <laughs> that sounds more like a comment than a... It, 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 it shouldn't be. It's not that hard. We're going to, with this software that we're talking about, you should just be able to apply, put in your observations and your predictions, and we can, from that, develop probabilistic predictions, and we can assess the reliability, precision, using the metrics that I've talked about today. It should be really easy. So we just want to make it easy enough that um, it becomes part of regular practice. Sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. now Let's talk about it later. Yeah. Excellent. There you go. There's your partner right there. Yeah, there we go. Well, thanks, Dave, and thanks, everybody, for sticking around. Thanks to the presenters. And so when you go home tonight, um, tell your family that behind every bad news stormwater story, there's a good news media story that isn't being covered because there's some great work going on in this state. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you.